vinegar. It'll turn down Margaret, the fan. Not this one, but the cliffs. Turn cliffs down just a little bit. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Well, here, you tell okay, the story. Are you ready? Okay. Everybody, uh, Megs wants to know about this house. Many years ago, I don't know how long ago, 20 or 30 years ago, I guess, <clears throat> I had a dream. You uh, it. I didn't. I, I just knew about the, my, this. This was always called the tree home. This is Frank Tree's Aggie Hughes tree home. And I was, uh, I was concerned because I had just, I just found out from a man's sister and aunt Lisa that Grandma uh, had lost her mother in childbirth. Grandma Maggie Hughes lost her child in birth for seven child. And uh, my sister was telling me one day that. about how she passed away and all that kind of stuff. So I, I had a, a, a nighttime dream or vision or whatever you want to call it. But I was right up here, kind of up in the air, and this was all a big yard right here. And this was a, 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 not nearly as big a house as it is now, but that was the house right there. And I, and I saw Frank Treat come home. He had a buggy. And I saw him come home, and I saw the I saw Grandma Black and two or three of the kids playing, which, where it says street closed, just to the left of that sign where it says street closed. And I saw them playing there, and I and I, I could read Frank Treat's mind, and I remember the hurt that he felt inside. I felt the hurt, and I I so I started to cry. And because uh, I felt the pain of him losing his wife, and then I remember that he thought to himself, "How do I tell my children?" See, I had always thought that she died right here, or that she or, or that she died over there. But they must have had a hospital with midwives or something, because Maggie did not die here. Frank had to come home here and tell the children that that, that, that their mother was not going to come home; that she was dead. And I remember right there with the little white, that little white garbage is in the street right down there. I saw three or four of the kids, and Grandma Black was one of them, playing right there with some little toys, some little dolls and stuff. There was no bikes or trikes; it was just little dolls and stuff, toys. And I remember that when Frank, that when Frank went in, in his mind, I don't know if you can tape this, but you only show it to whoever. In his mind, he and Maggie were very much in love, but like many couples, they had not always agreed on everything. And when he walked in that door right there where it says 211, I felt this overwhelming loss of his wife, and then I felt this deep regret that he and his wife had had some arguments from time to time. Now their marriage was not shaky. They had a good, stable marriage. Everything was cool, but when he had just lost his wife, he felt like, "Gee, I wish I would have loved her and been kind to her every day of our of our marriage, not just most of the time." And so when he went in that door right there, <clears throat> I was right up here, just kind of hovering up there, I guess. Where I had a guide with me, and. Uh, the guy didn't talk to me, but he just said, do you want to see what's, what's going on inside the house? And I was overwhelmed. I was feeling what Frank was feeling, the loss of his wife. Now he was sorry about, about any, uh, you know, any disputes they had had and all their years of marriage. And now they, there's kids out here playing. He has to go tell them your mom's not going to come home. And I said, yeah, I want to see. And so I saw right through that wall, that brick wall and that green and glass wall. All that glass wasn't there. It was just all a wall. There was a window right there, I think. And I remember seeing right through there, and I saw him go in, and I saw a little hallway, and I saw some bedrooms, and I saw him go in and kind of, you know, kind of get his mind oriented and get everything stabilized. And the kids 
saw him come in. The kids didn't even come running to him or nothing. The kids, I guess, dad came and went a lot, okay? Because the kids were still out there playing. And I was looking through there, and I remember thinking, I don't want any more sorrow. I don't, I, I heard enough. And so when he went in, before he told the kids, that's when my guide said, fine. And so we left. And so that happened right here. I was right up there, kind of in the air. And the grandma was right there, where that little white piece of garbage is in the road. And I looked right through there. And that's when I then realized that when you're in the spirit, uh, you can, like the Savior, you know, he actually moved through the wall. Remember those 12 apostles, except for Thomas the Doubter, they were all in a room together. And this, it was all locked up because the Romans were after him. And the Savior just moved right through. And it was the first time, and it's happened other times since, but it's the first time that I've actually realized that uh, all of this is actually very, very mortal type physical matter. And when you're in the spirit, this, the spirit is, is so much more powerful than all this mortal brick and, and, and stuff, cement, because I saw right through there. It was as if that wall did not even exist. And I just saw right through there, and I just felt all of his heartache and all of his hurt. And finally I said, that's enough. I don't want any more. I have felt enough. So that's why at the last reunion, Chuck was over here videotaping, and I kept pointing. Remember, I had a couple of the cousins. Yeah. I had Jim's daughter, Jim Parks' daughter. Yeah. I kept pointing to Chuck right down there. Right there where that little piece of garbage is, right behind the street clothes sign. That's where Grandma was with, uh, I, I didn't know if it was Aunt Sis or Aunt Liz or who it was. I don't know. All I knew was that it was that one of them was Grandma Black. And uh, so I guess when you die, if you want to, you can move through telephone poles. You can see wherever you want to see. I guess Heavenly Father, whenever he wants to look down and see, there's nothing to obstruct his vision. I think he can pretty much see whatever he wants to see. And I'm not sure whether Santa Claus can do it or not, but yeah, the song says you better be good because he can see everything. But Heavenly Father can. Because I, for a moment, I was able to see right through that wall right there. It wasn't even there. Just, I looked right through it. And oh, I'll tell you what, Frank looked at me very, very much. Because I felt very, very deep hurt. Because he loved what her so much. What generated this dream? Was it something you were working on, or did you have questions? Yeah, I would, no, I, because I just talked to Aunt Sis, and uh, and I was questioning, well, why did Frank? I mean, if I if if, if I lost Marcia, I would get all my kids around me. I wouldn't form them out. And Aunt Sis said that, that all of them are part of the family except Toadie. And so I didn't understand that. Yeah, I And so did. in that dream, I was allowed to feel that his and his hurt was so deep that uh, he had to protect his children so he gave them to family who would love to take care of them but he had to have one child with him because he had to earn a living and again it goes back to the almighty dog he was a little bit afraid that if he spent too much time worrying about family and death that it might somehow hurt the business because he was in great financial competition and the Corbett's and, and, and all of, all of uh, Hiram Stevens' uh, old ex-business partners. And so he was very, very concerned about his finances. And he just had to focus on that. And uh, the second thought that I had while I was looking through there was uh, his father, Levi Stewart Treat, lost his first wife uh, in childbirth. And uh, I remember came to him after that experience, after I had seen that experience, and after I had left, for some reason, wherever I was, still in bed, I guess, the thought came to me, because I was still having this dream, thing, the thought came to me that one of the things that would bring him comfort is when he realized that his own father had lost his first wife, by Stuart Treat had lost his first wife in childbirth, and remember, he took his, uh, his, 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 his one son with him, but he farmed out two of his kids. Remember? And the one daughter stayed, stayed close. And uh, so he was comforted a little bit by the fact that his father had done just fine with his life. He had remarried, 
Mary Dothea Cooper and uh, Levi Stewart Treat had a very successful, happy family life after he lost his first wife. And I was led to feel that one of the things that would comfort Frank Treat when he lost Maggie was the realization that just like his dad had farmed out his two kids, two of his three kids, so Frank could farm out his kids and eventually have them back. And of course he did. They were all family. I mean, he even bought them all homes in uh, Benson. And so he only farmed them out for a while until he got himself organized and his businesses organized. And uh, so that was that was my question was, why would you farm out your kids when you lose your wife? Yeah. That's when you would want to bring them close. But that's what his father had done. And that brought him comfort. So right down there. Right down there in the middle of that street. And this is all one big yard. And uh, that's where Frank came home to tell his kids that they just lost their mother. Grandma Black was one of those kids. And like Alec, she was really good looking when she was a child. <laughs> huh, Alec? Huh? You know, the thing is, is that we're sitting here listening to all these, and we believe it, and we have, have testimony born to us that these are, this is true, that this, this kind of medium for us can happen, can occur. But anybody else in the world would think you're crazy. Would think we're absolutely crazy. Especially when I'm a doctor, you know, when I stand up as bishop, and I go, well, I want to bear my testimony about this or that, you know, and if you get the least little bit genealogy, they go, ooh, ooh you know, yeah. it's space time. So that's why I don't tell these and stories. And I just wonder if some of them don't have their own experiences. Now one time, Carol Ann was so sick, so sick. We had, in the old family room, used to be a great big room, one room. And I was sleeping with her in her bed, and I saw this form, a circle of white go up, and it was Carol Ann, and she raised up from her pillow, and she started floating upwards in the spiral, and she went clear up, and I got on my knees. At first I grabbed like this, then I got on my knees. I couldn't hold her. Then I stood up in bed, and she just floated clear up out of my sight. I never knew to this day why, what it meant, but I lost Carol Ann that night. I lost her. I don't know what it she happened. I know what happened. I was there pulling and pulling down, and she was going away from me. Well, one of the biggest pains of my life was I was going into the Church Historical Society there in Salt Lake, just across this used to be just across the street from the genealogy library. I wanted to get Emma, Emma uh, Isom Stratton, and uh, and Charles Abel Stratton patriarchal blessings. He was the bishop for 13 years and uh, was was named after Emma Hale Smith. And uh, I want to get to patriarchal. So I went in and I went through the patriarchal blessing books, and they would not allow you to, to copy them in those days. There, were, there weren't Xerox machines, but I want to copy them by hand, but they would not allow that. So I just remembered as much as I could. And then I remember when I wanted to look at our patriarchal blessings. And Caroline being the oldest, I went to hers first. And I showed them, you know, my ID that I was a Stratton and this was my sister. And I remember the shock wave that went through me when I opened up that big book. It's in, you know, these big legal sized books. In those days, they actually had to send a handwritten copy to Salt Lake of every patriarchal blessing. And you opened it up, and somebody had written in big, in big uh, red letters, uh, excommunicated across oh. her patriarchal blessing. Oh, that's horrible. And that just, that just went deep. It's still there. I'm sure it's yeah. still there. So, I, anyway, we all have some memories about Carol Ann. We love her, but she's not seen to us anymore. She lost her endowment. Do you think that was the message I was getting? That might have been part of the message you were getting. Was that, was that she was going to struggle. Now, maybe during the spirit world or millennium, she will come back. But Bob was there last week visiting her. And so those ties are still there, some of them. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about Carol Ann. I went through my own little personal, uh, you know, withdrawal with that. I think someday she'll, she'll be our 
yours because Dad one time told me that, that he had a dream where he said that all of his babies would be his. And he says, I'm holding the Lord to that part of my patriarchal blessing. And that's patriarchal blessing. He prayed about it, and he said that that's going to happen. His patriarch, I haven't read his patriarchal blessing for many years, but he told me one day in his bedroom when he was getting dressed, because I was back there, you know, we were waiting to go outside and work in the yard or something. And this was after we were married. Marsha and the kids were in the, you know, in the other room. And I asked him, so what's going to happen to Carol Ann, Dad? You know, we just always talked real blunt to Dad. And he said, in my patriarchal blessing, son, it says that I will have all of my children. And he said, I've prayed about it, and I will have all of my children. So I don't know when, but someday, somebody's going to get to go to the temple for her, and have her sealed to us, and she will be ours. But she's not here now, and she's not here in more ways than just physically. And so, but that's now. Tomorrow may be a different day. Hey Cliff, you want to show your mom that that parking lot that's the old church okay, that her grandma went to? Marcia says, let's move on. I'm getting too full of hot air. So what we're going to do is let's go back to the, I have to get my bearings here. <laughs> it's to your right, honey, that church. Yep, I need to go over here. Like this is Church Avenue. This is Church Avenue. We're going to come right down here and just go that, that way and see that. There's the YMCA right there. Okay. That's where Mom spent many hours at the YMCA. Oh, right here. gosh. And that was my babysitter. I, I never knew it until I got older that they just let me go Simmons and get rid of me. That's right. And go Lizzie, to the Y. And Lizzie dropped her off on her way to work, and Mom spent the entire day here. No wonder she heard this. Mom, morning. right here, this parking lot. It, it, right here. Oh, right there? Uh-huh. No, that wasn't it. Hang on. I need to get oriented here, baby. One of them. No, I need to go up Alameda here. Hold on. Let me show it to you. I can show it to you. Oops, which way did I go? Yep, I went to the... Uh, hold still. There's a That's where the wall is. We have to go over here. I need to get my bearings. Hold on just a minute, guys. Hang on. Okay. Okay. Hey, what was the thing about the baby on the wall? I gotta go one more. Okay, what happened was when Adonashia was about Alex's, about Alex's age. Margaret Fan. About 10. About 10 or 11, because she got married at age 11. So when, when she was about Alex's age, she had a friend a little bit older than her. And by friend, that means we were somehow related, probably a cousin or something. Uh, and they were starting to tear down the San Augustine church that was inside the old Presidio, because they were tearing down the wall. So the end of that pink building that we saw right there, the pink building, remember with the archways? Okay, they were going to tear that down. They were tearing that down. And what they did was, she said that they had actually boarded up the front door to the church, and a lot of, a lot of whatever windows there were had been, you know, had been uh, broken out, or the wood in them had been broken out. So they actually had to climb in. I'm going to tell you the story first, because this is it right here. So they actually, and I said that they actually had to climb in this church because they did not want any children playing in there. So, and this church was the pink one down there. We just saw the pink one at the end, at, at the end of the presidio, yeah. inside the wall. When that got really, really old, this girl had had a baby that had died within just a few months, and uh, because the the mother, uh, the mother's parents were very high muckety mucks in the Tucson area, and that's why we think that she was actually related to Adonashia. Adonashia just did not say, you know, that this was my cousin, because she was afraid that somebody might disapprove that they dug a baby out of a wall, out of a church wall. So being very discreet, Adonashia said that we, we tore down some of the, some of the slats off of the, by, by, by the, the, the front door, and they climbed inside, and they went over to where the baby had been buried, kind of mausoleum style, inside of one of the newer walls. I guess they took the walls and they added on to them, you know, stuck people in them. But you had to be very, you had to be pretty hot shot to get buried inside of the Catholic Church. So it was a very prominent uh, family. So anyway, so the mother went in with Adonashia and 
we assumed another friend or two, because Wade and Ashley keeps talking, it's like we, 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 so there was more than just one or two. And they went to where the baby's name was, and they store off, they, 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 they took some of the old boards, and they, they chipped away all that old stucco. They dug the baby out, and the baby's body was not decayed too much yet, so it must have been pretty recent. And she took her reboso, and she wound it up on her head, and put the baby inside of the reboso, and then covered the baby with the, with the reboso. And they got out of the church, and she put the reboso on with the baby on top, and they walked right down through downtown, right down, right down Al Alameda Street, down to where this teenage daughter's family lived. And without telling them, Adonisha said that they went out back behind, and they dug a shallow grave, and put the baby in the shallow grave, and the mother said, you cannot tell anybody that my baby's buried here, but I will not have my baby go down with an old broken down church. And that was the old broken down church, was the pink building with the arches. It was, it was right there by Campo Santo. That was the church that she dug it out of. Okay, so that ends that story. Now, what they did was, remember we said that the, that the, the Anglos, when they came to Tucson, they decided they were going to bury their white dead along with all the Mexicans and the Indians and the Spanish in Campo Santo. And this is, you know, from here on back. The Presidio is right over there. One, one battalion uh, monuments is, is about, what, less than 100 yards right down that road right there, okay? So what they did was the Anglos, when they buried some of their soldiers there, they wanted to use the back part of the Presidio for something. I don't know what, military. And so they decided to move the bodies out of Campo Santo and bury them somewhere else. Well, the old timers said you can't move them very far from Campo Santos because Campo Santos, that is, that's, the, that's where our ancestors are buried. Our Indians and Spanish and Mexican ancestors are buried. They said, okay, what we'll do is we'll just put it on the outside of the cemetery. So they dug up however many bodies, we don't know however many, but at least the Anglos and, and whoever was recently buried, and they buried them right here, where this vacant lot is. So this was the very outside of Campo Santos, right here, okay? Then, when they, they moved and expanded out here, they then took these bodies and buried them up at Holy Hope and, uh, and, the, and Evergreen Cemetery. So the bottom line is, is there may be some of our ancestors buried here, but it's not likely. Probably 80% of all of our Modesto Radio Santa Cruz and Mariana Gonzalez and all of our Desayas and Perillas and Martinez's, they're probably all buried from this vacant lot between here and where that little church is 100 yards down this street right here. Because this was Campo Santos. Okay? <coughs> There may have been Grandma Stratton, there may have been a little chapel right here with this, with this cemetery. And this could have been where Adonasha was walking to, because her house is just over there three blocks. Yeah, that probably is. So this was the outside edge of Campo Santos on your map. I gave it a, figure, a letter on your map. It is F. So this is F on your map. So here, this is Campo Santos here, and so we are right at about here, F. You see that road is Alameda, that, that's the main road through. Can you hold that up, Cliff? Yeah, this is the main road, Alameda. This is the main road going right through there, and there's the church, and there's the Mormon Battalion, right down there about a block, okay? And so we are from the E right here, we are right about there. They buried them on the outside of, of Campo Santos. So some of our ancestors may be buried here if they were the ones that, that the Anglos happened to pick, you know, happened to dig up. But it's not likely. But that could be where some of our ancestors are buried. Mm -hmm. Chances are they're underneath those big skyscrapers over there. That's where our ancestors are be resurrected from. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be buried next to your ancestors, you have to get buried right underneath the, the bank building. <laughs> okay, one more thing, and then we'll move on to something else. Any questions about Campo Santos?
Thank you so much. Mike. Everybody understand? Thank you. But now, now, which one was it? That, it was the one in the pink? Where, where the, yes. That's Look. the one that had the facade that is now on the front. No, no, it? we haven't been there yet. That's, oh. that's, that's the original one in the back of the Presidio. It's like a San Augustin church. Okay, that's the one where the walls was falling down, and we'll, we'll go that way. I'll show you. Is that the one where the baby was buried? That's where in? the baby was, the original oh. San Augustin church. So oh. see, it wasn't torn it's down exactly. until after 1850, till after Adonisha. About 1860 before it was torn down. Oh, okay. Well, Campos is uh, countryside. It's oh. outside of the city. So, countryside of the saints, santos or saints. Oh. So it's the it's the uh, the resting place of the saints. The countryside, the resting place of the saints. Yeah. Oh. So we're going right down. This is the this is the presidio. Right Think of here. camping, campo. Yeah. Because there, that that pink side, not the whole pink side. I'm glad we got a red light. Okay. There's one battalion monument. See down there. Yeah. And see this big pink building. Yeah. That back part right there from the big archway and stuff right there that was the original San Augustine Church where she dug out the bodies all of this was Campo Santos and they moved the bodies the Anglican bodies from here to that lot vacant lot we just came from okay, okay? so this was all chances are Ignacio Bohuraquez is right there <laughs> <laughs> and Juan Baptiste is right there <laughs> This is sacred ground for, okay, so now what we're going to do now is we're going to follow, there's the church, there's the battalion, you all know where you are? Uh -huh. Sam Hughes is over there. We're going to go right down this, right down here, to where they moved from this San Augustine church, inside of the Presidio, down to the San Augustine church where Ananasia went to church with Guadalupe and Petra most of her adult life. And that is, oops, I don't want to do that. And that is where the, uh, where the Pancho Villa is. I did that once before. I do want to turn here. This is the Pancho Villa park right here. This, they moved the church from the pink building and they built a brand new one right here. See Church Avenue, it says? That's where both churches were. This is where Adonasha and Petra and Guadalupe belonged to all the clubs and organizations in the Catholic Church. And right there where that statue is, that was the door to the church and the big facade over the door to the church is the front of the Arizona Historical Society. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Now are we all straight? Yeah, I'm not straight. That's it right there. Oh, who is the man on the horse? That is Pancho Villa. Oh, that is Pancho Villa? Some people like Pancho Villa. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Some people don't like Pancho Villa. Okay, guys, I'm all through. I'm done. I got a, a police officer up here. What am I going to do? Are we going to go back to the motel for a while? Or do you want to go see the Mayan stuff inside of the uh, Hiram Stevens home? While we're out, let's go do Mayan. Yeah. You want to do Mayan stuff? Then we can go back and crash and get our all of our stuff done. Okay. I remember right that parking lot right past this building is where the Juan Santa Cruz home was. You can see the, you see the, the metal fence? That was the wall. We stood right up there oh, in the yeah. shade. So this is the Juan. This is the uh, Juan Santa Cruz built originally by Modesto Eladio Santa Cruz on the side of that building. But they went downtown Tucson is big for our family, guys. This is big history for our family. Great. Thank you, Clifford, for doing this for us. It's been fun. Latest vision or dream that you had? Yeah, where Grandma came where to Grandma me again. Came to oh, me. She comes to me more than anybody. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you about that when we stop up here. We'll stop in front of the Hiram Stevens home and we'll talk about spiritual things. How's that? <laughs> Clap. Call me Corbin. Oh, oh, oh. Clap. Be nice. Okay, so this is the main road up. There's the battalion over there. This is where the the, the motel was. Ormsby House Motel, and this was. Hiram Stevens is home right here, and in here we want to go see the, the Mayan artwork. So let's find a park. I'm going to let you all off. Actually, Hold on. I'm going to... We can park around back by where the, okay, the we'll garden is. Okay, we'll go before. <coughs> Grandma for a second. Okay. Yeah.
Play by Grandma. Oh, we have Grandma. No, we haven't. Our grandma, grandma Black. Black. Grandma Black. Oh, Grandma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. About, when was it? It was only about, oh, six Man. months ago or so. I, uh, I don't know. You, you put Chuck's tape and all this. They're going to think for us. crazy. It's just for us and our kids. Short of a full load. Oh, we already know. We that. know that. So they already know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I was, I was just beginning to realize that the spirit world was definitely dumping information on us because uh, in two years we hadn't talked. I mean, I had spent the 20 years, 25 years, trying to find information, and in two years, all of a sudden, all this comes about. And I said, wait a minute, I may be slow, but you know what? Cliff Stratton didn't do this. Somebody's been giving me all this information from the spirit world. Because everywhere I went, any library I went into, uh, we had Marcia's cousin that said, you want to know about Hiram Stevens? I'll find out for you. And we're going, oh, really? And so uh, all of a sudden, all this stuff is just, just falling out of heaven for us. And so I thought, why is that happening? Why would I bust my butt for all those years, for a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here, and all of a sudden have all this information? And that's when Grandma came. And I was wide awake. I was just laying there in bed, wide awake, and it was in the daytime. I was. I used to teach a, a class at Truckee Meadows in the evening, an anatomy and physiology class. I was just laying there listening to some tunes and relaxing between jobs. And uh, if you know my bedroom, my window's over here, and then my King size beds there, and right behind my king size bed is this big, uh, what's it called, Chuck? Uh, Armoire. Uh, uh -huh. You know where you put your socks and garments dresser. and stuff, and the, a big dresser, and it's got a big mirror on it, some little shelves. And I was laying there, and Grandma just just came just came right up to me, just came right out, and uh, she never said a word. It's really cool because in the spirit world you don't talk with words, you just read each other's minds. And you're allowed, uh, you're allowed to have other people read your mind for whatever you want them to read and not read whatever you don't want them to read their mind, okay? And so Grandma came and she looked just like the Grandma I knew when I was, when I was going down to the valley playing football and basketball in high school. She was a very young Grandma. And she had one of her uh, light, uh, you know, almost flowery yeah. dresses on, you know, like yeah. she used to wear a lot. Yeah. And I remember thinking, well, Grandma, why are you wearing that? And I remember that the thought came back because this is how you would recognize me. Because I know that she's accepted the gospel. No doubt about it. Most of this came from Grandma Black. She may not be the leader in the spirit world, but she's one of the leaders, one of the leaders in the spirit world, giving us, giving us all, all this information. And so I thought, well, gee, it'd be nice if I could see you in your whites, because then I would know that you had accepted the gospel and everything was cool. And the thought came back to me from her. What do you want me to do? Knock you over the head? I mean, look at all the information we've given you. You know, all the temple work you've done the last two years. And this was before the 920 names. Because I've, you know, I've submitted, what, three or four hundred names, you know. So I thought, yeah, you have. You've given me a lot of names. We've got a lot of temple work done. That's cool. Okay. <clears throat> and then she became so happy that I could just feel the happiness inside of her. And she smiled. And even though she didn't actually turn around, in my mind, she was so happy, I saw her as if she was twirling around and dancing with just happiness, with glee, with joy. And I thought, I, I asked her, I said, well, why do you want me to feel that, that you're so happy? And she didn't say, it's interesting now that we submitted the 920 names. What she said was, she said, I'm sure that the names that we are giving you, that you will do the work for. And I thought, what do you mean, will? I said, I just submitted 300, 400 names the last, you know, during my lifetime. And, and that's when I realized then, that when I was sitting in the, in, in the temple a couple weeks later, and I thought, well, I'm all prepared for my mission. You know, we got our, we got our uh, real estate investments liquidated, you know, and we got all of our shots, and, you know, we had all of our physicals and all that kind of stuff, and all of our dental work, I had to have a tooth pulled out down there. I had an ingrown root from uh, uh, many years ago. And then the thought came to me, no. Grandma came and said that, there, that you would do the work for all of those names that she would give you. 
and I had it didn't dawn on me till then. I said, "What do you mean would give me?" I said, "I've, I've done every name that she's ever given me," and thought came, "Nope, you can't do it on your mission. You got to do it right now, because they are doing all this work for you, and now they want you to do the work now, because you're a strat and you're going to put it off forever and ever." I guess. Okay, that was my thought. So I thought, okay. So that's when I went. I mean, it had to be pretty. It had to be pretty strong because I went to the temple. We went to IHOP, and Marcia went home in her car, and I went back to work, and I took a, uh, an annual leave, and I checked out for seven days, and then from morning until night, I stole Marcia's computer, and she loves her computer, and I stole her computer, and for seven days I went through every one of my files. And that's when I found that big census that I sent you the names on and all the other names that I've been gathering the last two years, plus all the little nitpicky ones I had before then, 120 names. And that's when I thought, and this is where you got mad at me, that's when I thought, now Grandma Tim, Grandma Timmy, Grandma uh, Black didn't say, uh, we want you to find these names, okay? What she said was, we know that you will do the work for us, the temple work for us. It wasn't just find us. It wasn't just submit our names. It was you'll actually make sure that all this work gets done that we've given you. So that's when I said, okay, I'm going to submit all 920 names to the temple file because that way family's not involved. Nobody can forget and lose a couple of blue cards or pink cards or, or yellow cards for ceilings. All the names will be done. So I submitted them all over to temple file. Then Meg sends me this really nice email that says, if you want to be my brother in the next world, you will send me some names. I had to go back to the temple to Wanda nice Jones. And to Wanda Jones, I said, Wanda, you know those names you just processed? Would you please give me the census, the 1864 census or whatever it was? 1844 to Eight, 1848. Yeah, 1844 to 1848, because that was Adonasia and all of her friends in Tubac, Tumacockery, and Tucson. And she says, oh, I don't know, Bishop, if I can do that. And I said, if you don't, I'm dead meat. <laughs> she said, I'll see what I can do. So she went in, and she redid the file, and she got you your names. I'm so grateful. So that's how you got your names. So Grandma does not want us just to find the names, because she's given us the names. We haven't really found them. She's given us these names. Let's be honest. I mean, Cliff Stratton has worked his whole life and I never could have written these in, except for the last two years when the information has just fallen out on me. Okay? People that I never even knew were sending me pictures and were sending me you know, uh, uh, newspaper clippings and stuff. Okay, so that's all good. History's fine. <clears throat> but she wanted to make sure that the work was all done. That's why when I sent you those names, I said, I wash my hands. I'm Pilot. I wash my hands. If they, you they've don't do those baptized. work. <laughs> they've all been baptized. <laughs> Last week, no. before last week, there's no. We have All right. No, no, no. We Cheryl's going to tell on you. We have one, one group of, of male <laughs> names. There's 20 male names that have not been she baptized yet, but everybody else has. And we have another temple session coming up with our board that they're going to finish the last of the baptisms. And then we're going to start on all of the rest of the stuff. But well, I know being married to a sealer that you'd probably get it done. <laughs> but I felt so strong, Grandma Black was so strong that we would do that work that they had given us. Because it was as if she said, I know you're going on a mission and you've got to do it now. Because I have put off for 30 years doing some of these names. And so she did not want me to put off anymore. And so she says, you will do it now. And then the second thought that came to me was, she wants it done so badly that Marcia and I had a hand full of names that we had only done partial partials on, I sent those to Marlene. I said, Marlene, you do them. Finish them. So I do not have any family temple names. I am going to do what the Holy Ghost said and what Grandma said. I'm going on a mission. And when I go into that MTC, every name is going to have, I will know, is going to have been done or very close to it. Well, well two years ago when we were getting the first reunion ready, I just had this strong urgency. It was like some force beyond myself. I, and I told my kids and my husband that. There's just somebody telling me we've got to have a, a, a Hughes family reunion. And that's what I need to focus on next. That's what I need to do. And I was so busy. You said, we said, President, I had a hundred million things. 
but I just was driven to have this family reunion. And it took me a year and a half to find about 175 Hughes relatives that were that are still alive. And I only knew 20 of the or 30 of the original ones, and most of us them were us, you know. So I, I knew hardly anyone. And now we found even additional ones, probably another 30 or so since then. But one of the thoughts that occurred to me at that time was there there are names that Cliff has that are bit that are hidden in his files that are buried that need to have the work done. So when you said that you were going to go back through and after we first got back from the reunion, that you were going to go home and do all of those Armando names or something that you... But see, I didn't. I waited 18 months until Grandma came to me. So... I was put... This was always tomorrow. Yeah. Until we went... Until we got the mission papers turned in. And then there's no more tomorrow. And Grandma said, no well, more I waiting. want you all to know, on tape, since we're just talking to family, that, that first reunion two years ago, I thought, oh, Megs is doing it again. Miss Relief Society President's trying to get a big and, family reunion and together. He, and he kept and, saying, I'm not coming, I'm not coming. And I just kept praying. And I, I kept, felt like under all this pressure, like, what do I need to go to Tucson? I used to live there. I've been here for several times for meetings, for scientific papers. I don't need to go to Tucson to do genealogy. And then when I got here, I noticed that you put me with Chuck. And Chuck, he had this, this ball and chain around my foot. And every time I would go to leave, the, leave our room, he would say, Where are you going, big brother? I mean, he kept me, so I knew I had to give the present out. I thought, okay, I'll make everybody happy. Chuck and Megs will both be happy. I'll just give my little afternoon talk and be done with it. And after we showed the people in the spirit world that we were going to do what they asked us to do, this last two years has just been flooding. 920 names. I was sitting on and, and, and have been given to me this last year and a half. 920 names is even if only one out of three. And remember now, they're all Israelites. They all have Ephraim from, from Ishmael, and they all have Manasseh from Lehi, and they all have Judah from Laban's uh, servant. These people, Lamanites, they all have three of the blood of Israel in them. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Judah. They have to have been some of those that were under the covenant in the pre-existence. Chances are more than one-third is going to accept the gospel sooner or later. So we just take the minimum. One-third of 920 is 300 names. When I was bishop, my ward was only like about 310 people in a big ward, Sparks First Ward. So if only one-third of these names accepts the gospel, we have literally formed, statistically at least, an entire ward in the spirit world of our family and their <laughs> friends. And that is huge. That is more than huge. That's, that's humongous. And that's what Grandma was saying. Grandma was telling me, not, we love you and we're glad you got all these histories and we're glad that we got Megs to do all of these reunions. You will do the work for the names that we've sent you, right? And I said, yes, ma'am, we will. And so I sent Megs the names and I sent Marlene and, the names. And we have to go back another step in the history of all of this, the evolution. It was my son-in-law, who was not even a member of our bloodline, is the one who first got us Brian. involved. Brian, he came down here to do some computer but work. I mean, I was and, and mother told him, uh, oh, I have, you know, one of my, my great-grandfather, my grandfather. Well, he came and said, I said, they came for the weekend, Carrie and Brian, the children. I said, yeah. said oh, we, we were having so much fun. I said, why don't you stay over another day? And don't go home tonight. And Brian says, no, I have to be in Tucson tomorrow. I have to go visit all these schools, great schools, for my company that I work for. And I said, you got a list of schools? Is Sam used? school on that list? He said, yes, I'm going to go to Sam Hughes School. And so the next morning when the phone rang, he said, Grandma, guess where I am? I'm standing on the steps of the Sam Hughes School. And then he went in there and found out that uh, one of the teachers there, Mr. T, forgot that was like Teague or something like that, had all of these uh, the old pictures oh, and all the old pictures yeah. that he found up in the attic, and so uh, that's more so, from the spirit world. You know, Why would he find it right now? Yeah, he found all of those. He found out that the school was having their 75th anniversary the following October, and so 
that was when we planned our whole reunion then around the 75th anniversary of the Sam Hughes Elementary School. And we got all of this information from them and then from then all this that and so it was Brian that really we started, started it thing. by talking to mom. And he was so inspired by the family. He said, I just love Sam Hughes. He was such a great man. And in fact he came down and took pictures, you know, and he was yeah, able to get into the Sam Hughes home yes. and the rest of us yeah. couldn't get in. You know, and he went in and took the pictures. So there's really two take home messages for the family. One is Meg's was definitely inspired by the Holy Ghost to have that first get together. That was when the spirit world said, are we going to take our time? We want somebody to do our work. Can we work through Meg's? Cliff is a lost cause. <laughs> He's lived in Tucson. He submitted about three or four hundred names. We got to have a mover and a shaker. She's not busy at all. She's just relief society president, state relief society president, you know, and has a husband and kids. So I always thought you were just kind of being a pain in the neck for the first one. But when all of that information came, I realized that it was meant from heaven for you to have that first one. Megs was, was inspired that. to have that first reunion because it opened the door for us to be here today and to be in the temples. And the second thing is, is we don't want to take too much credit for all of this. Oh, no. Because I have struggled and struggled for years, like Marsha was saying at lunch, and you get a little name here and a little baptism date there, a little burial date there. And for the last two or two and a half years, the heavens have just opened. And we have just got names and dates and stories and newspaper articles just just poured out upon us. So we don't want to take too much credit for all of this. Of course, the Gentiles will understand. We can't stand up tomorrow and say, yes, Heavenly Father wanted all of your ancestors to have their temple work done. <laughs> they may not understand that, okay? But we need, in, in this van, endowed members, we need to be aware that there have been forces beyond our control under the direction of the priesthood and inspired by the Holy Ghost and the spirit world because they have the veil of forgetfulness there too, that they wanted their family to have the ordinances of the temple. <coughs> And they decided that we would be the ones that would do that. And I think one of the spin-offs for Megs is because they couldn't get me to do it because I was just sitting on all those names. And I was still going to sit them on, on my mission. I was still going to sit on those names on my mission. And Drama was not going to allow that. But I think that what Megs was allowed to do as a blessing for her was to gather the living together. I think that's a spin-off from the temple work. I still think the temple work is number one. That's what counts, because that's what they want. But I think you're gathering, living together, and forming relationships now that are going to last forever. Because when they die, they're going to go see Sam and Adonashia. And they're going to say, I know all about you. Megs Jorgensen had this reunion down there. And so I think that you're bringing the living together is kind of a spin-off blessing for all of us, and especially well, for you. And, and if their ancestors, our ancestors, are accepting the gospel in the spirit world, of course of they are. want their children and their children's children to have accepted the gospel too, you know? In fact, if I do have any guilt feelings left, after my mission, I have felt like, Linda's going to talk about Jesse. I have worried about doing the temple work for all of the extended marriages and stuff of Sam's brothers and sisters. We have done so much New Spain, all the Bojorquezes and Santa Cruzes and Perias and Sosas, Morenos. I wonder, Martinez says, I wonder if maybe we shouldn't do the same thing for Sam's side. Because I lived in Wales. I can go through Welch records. I, I, could, I could probably spend two or three weeks in Wales and do the same thing if the spirit world would help me. Do the same thing for Sam's family as we've done here in Tucson for Adam Ash's family. And I wonder if that would be something that would be worth considering later. But for right now, we're here for Hughes's, I mean for Santa Cruz and Bojorquez's. But maybe someday we ought to look at Sam's side a little bit deeper. Because he was a good guy. And in all honesty, I've known about this whole, this whole brothel thing for a long time. And I've had family whisper and said, hey, if his number one business partner opened a brothel, couldn't Sam go there for free? You know what the answer is? He could go there for free. But you know what? Sam was so proud that he never went there for free. He was so proud of, that he had chosen to live a good, clean life and a good, clean Mason life, okay? That I have never heard anybody in the family say, yeah, Sam snuck down there once. And believe me, if Sam would have snuck down there once, 
I would have heard about it because that's the kind of stuff that goes through a family like wildfire. So I am absolutely convinced that Sam is pure and clean, that Hiram stood alone in some of the things that he did. And he left Sam to pick up the mess. That's you can what tell I, by the way Sam lived his life, what kind yes. of man he was. If you, oh, yes. if you look at Sam's whole life of charity and helping widows and paying their taxes and stuff, and then you, and you look at Hiram's life of you know, giving whiskey to the soldiers so they would come to his, you know, and buy from his store, their outlooks on life were totally different. Now again, with the Corbett's, you trees have to be careful because the, the Corbett's do not agree with the trees. They, oh, think they just don't cool. know everything I know. <laughs> yep. All, all, all I know is is that I have worked very hard to have him because like Ruthie is the leader of the pack of the Corbett's and I've been the leader, the leader of the pack of the treats, Ruthie and I get along so well that she was the money keeper for the tombstone for Guadalupe and Victoria. We have a very close relationship and that's, that has to go in the next life. We may have to go in the next life and mend fences between the Corbett's and the treats because we are we are the leaven and the loaf on both sides of the veil. How old is she? Is she older than you? Very much. About older? my age. She's about my same age. Ruthie is. I think she's no, about. she's older. She's about 64, 65 now. I think. Don't oh, you think, Marsh? She yeah, she's a, a little bit older than you. Yeah. But you know, as as we're talking, I'm getting this confirmation of the spirit. One of the things in my blessing says that I will be able to teach a type of people that is difficult for anyone else to teach. And I'm keeping thinking now, this is my family in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. You know? I've only just begun. You wait till we see the, the kind of work we have to do after we all die. Because Chuck <laughs> went to Spain and I went to Wales. I'm convinced that once Chuck and I die, and once you girls die, I think we don't have to worry about being called on missions to teach the, you know, to teach the ancient uh, or whatever. I think our missionary calling side to the veil because Chuck was, was not sent to Spain and I was not sent to Wales for this generation. I think we were sent because of previous generations. I think Chuck is going to embrace Eladio Santa Cruz and he's going to say thank you Chuck for teaching my family. Did you have the priesthood? <laughs> okay let's go. Let's go. Oh, Enough. Grandma's very happy. She's <laughs> very very happy with us. Grandma Black. Is. She okay. sure loves her. You kids I'll tell you.